You've been doing a number of different security operations, if you will, gaming out what happens on election night if we don't have results right away. In fact, that very well could be the case. What does that look like and how does Facebook handle misinformation in the hours immediately following the polls closing? Thanks for having me, Emily. And I mean, I think it looks more and more like we won't have results on election night. And we have to think about in that period of uncertainty, as more voters than ever are voting vote by mail, and as the states are counting those ballots, how do we ensure that there is accurate information for voters and that we have all the protections in place to defend against any kind of influence operation or disinformation campaign that would target that uncertainty? The voting information centers that we're launching today are intended to do exactly this. In the lead up to the election, they're going to provide accurate, current information on when or how to vote, how to register to vote, how to check to make sure you're registered, how to request a vote by mail or absentee ballot if you need to do that in your state, and up-to-date information on how systems might change due to coronavirus. But on election night and during that period of uncertainty, we'll use this same system to provide information to users about how the vote is happening, what the count is, how the count is proceeding, what they should expect next, and importantly, what the process is. One of the things that we've seen over and over again, my bread and butter I focus on are security threats, foreign actors or domestic actors that are trying to manipulate public debate. That type of thing is most effective when people are uncertain, when you don't know what the truth is. And so showing people right at the top of their news feed on posts that reference voting, here is what to expect, here is how the process is working, and it's working as it should. Giving that kind of reassurance can help to inoculate public debate against these influence operations. I spoke with Facebook CEO Sheryl Sandberg yesterday who talked about the rise in misinformation and hate speech that you're taking off the platform. But what about the critics who say the real way to safeguard the election is to take down more misinformation, specifically posts by the president of the United States about things like mail-in voting that are for sure misleading and even blatantly untrue? When an elected official is making claims about voting, I think it's really important that the public can see those claims. To be honest, particularly now as the election is heating up, I suspect understanding what the president and others are saying about voting is going to factor into people's choice of how they vote this fall and who they vote for. But at the same time, you need people to have accurate information from the experts about what the ground truth about voting is. And so the Voting Information Center and the labels are designed to strike exactly that balance, to make sure that if someone sees an elected official or any prominent figure making a claim about how reliable or trustworthy the election is, they will also see analysis from bipartisan election experts on how the process works, what the components of it are, what they should expect, and what safeguards are built into it. We take this type of content-based work, and just so that it's clear here, this content work is only one piece of the puzzle. We also are continually tracking for deceptive behavior. That is, any actor here in the U.S. or overseas that's using fake accounts to mislead people about who they are and the purpose of what they're doing on Facebook. The Russians did this in 2016. Let's talk about... And we're seeing... Please. Right, right. And, and I know that you're working to, to prevent what happened with Russia in 2016. A network of fake Chinese accounts has been posting videos bashing President Trump. This as tensions between the U.S. and China have ratcheted up. How concerned are you about a rising China threat, given the vast technological resources of China leading into this election, China specifically? We see a whole range of threat actors engaging these types of techniques. So far this year, we've done takedowns involving Russia and Iran. We've also started labeling state-controlled media around the world and blocking ads from state-controlled media into the United States, including state-controlled media from China, because of some of this activity. The network that you're referring to, though, I think, is a group, is a network that's been called Spamiflage Dragon by the independent research community that's been writing about it. And what's interesting is this network is active across a whole range of platforms. The majority of their activity has been on Twitter and YouTube. We've seen limited activity on Facebook. Last year, we removed a spam network, not terribly sophisticated, sharing memes and other types of information linked to this network. 
Just recently, we saw some of the people behind that trying to come back, and we stopped them and took them down again. But it's interesting to note that these operations happen across all social media platforms. They also target traditional media. And sometimes what you see on one platform is different from what you see on another. We've seen more deceptive activity from Russian and Iranian actors, but that doesn't mean that Chinese actors aren't also aggressive. And it's something that we have teams watching for very carefully. And the bad actors, Nathaniel, we've talked about this, are always one step ahead. And more and more of the deceptive activity is coming from domestic actors. How big a threat is domestic misinformation? And how can you really uh, get a handle on it when the threat, the, the, the bad actors are always, again, one step ahead? So more than half of the major takedowns that we do, I should say, we conduct investigations into these networks. Whenever we find one, we announce it publicly and we share information with independent researchers so they can do their own analysis. More than half of those investigations have been about domestic actors. In fact, just last month, we took down nine networks from around the world, including a number of domestic actors, some operating right here in the US. Because those investigations are focused on behavior, are they using fake accounts? Are they misleading people about who's behind them? How are they deceiving people in their activity? As opposed to content, it doesn't matter whether they're foreign or domestic. We can find them and enforce against them in the same way. You are also asking how we stay ahead of them. And this behavioral point is important again. Over the past two years, we've seen threat actors take a number of steps to try to hide from the teams that are hunting for them. Teams at Facebook, at Twitter, at Google, also teams within the US government and independent researchers, all of whom are working together to tackle this challenge. What's interesting is we've seen them do things like change their content. For example, there was an operation last year that used artificially intelligence, that used images generated with machine right. learning to make their accounts look more real. That's a content change. The problem is their behavior still tips us off. It still exposes them. So even as they're trying to get better Nathaniel, and you see that they are, the defenders are getting better faster. Uh Quickly, one last question. Speaking of domestic actors, NBC has reported you have millions of followers of right-wing conspiracy groups like QAnon. Why haven't you banned them? Why not take those down? So that's exactly why the security challenge around public debate is so hard. I think we should level set. Um, we have about 3 billion people on the platform around the world. They make billions of posts every day. QAnon is a tiny, tiny fraction of that. But it's good to focus on them because they are pushing the boundaries around what freedom of expression should permit, and they're causing harm. What we're doing here is a couple of things. First, we take aggressive action against QAnon groups when they cross our thresholds. For example, we removed a group just this week for violating our content policies that's linked to QAnon, and my team, which focuses on deceptive behavior, has found and removed two separate networks that had some links to QAnon or were sharing okay. QAnon-type information. But our teams are also looking at what's happening, assessing our policies around Q, and exploring additional actions we can take. I think we have to be careful here, because if you drive these actors too far underground, you can end up actually sort of uh, reifying their belief, making them feel like they're being excluded. We need to be as effective as possible in stopping this type of behavior, but also ensure that the public debate that's happening on the platforms still happens and is still as robust as ever.